And so I remember um, feeling, I felt like a freak. I felt, I felt like I had been abandoned. Um, and I, and it was the first time I ever had this like bubble in my chest of literally feeling like I'm angry with God. Sometimes a story tells it all. Usually on this show, we find a theme either from someone's specific story or we pick one and find stories to match it. Today's episode is harder to nail down in terms of themes. There's some quirky church stories, some charismania, some suffering and abandonment, some starting over. And that's exactly what we like about it. Our guest today is our new friend, Jesse. Jesse's story resonates with us here at The Life After because we think it resonates with everyone who has been deeply involved in religion and then journeyed out. Infatuation, growth, rebellion, disillusionment, feeling alone, and then finding your way again. No matter where you are in that narrative, there's something for you here. You're listening to The Life After. I'm Chuck Parson. I'm Brady Harden. And this is our interview with Jesse. Welcome to Life After. This is Brady Harden, and I am here with Chuck Parson. And we have our guest. We're going to bring her on a little bit early today because um, I think she's pretty badass, and I think she's got some things to say. Um, and we're <laughs> going to talk to her right away. But before I do, um, one thing we have not talked about on the show very much is interesting things to do with the charismatic movement, um, the the magicians and the wizards of the Christian. <laughs> Of evangelicalism, I call them. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, I would say the charismatics would be definitely the the mages. They've got the most magic, yeah. magical things that they can do. Um, and here today we have our wonderful friend, Jesse. Jesse, say hi. Hi. Well, Jesse, let's jump right in. Um, tell us what you, your Christianity looked like when you were a Christian growing up. What was that like? So I grew up in Orlando, Florida. Which, and I, and I was Southern Baptist. I grew up Southern Baptist in Orlando. So it was a lot of um, conservative, but then the paradox that we wore bikinis every day and rode jet skis. So that was oh, interesting. Wow. And um, I think my parents called themselves first generation Christians, uh, ah. which means they didn't really know. I think it was their excuse to say they didn't really know what they were doing. <laughs> and um which is why you're allowed to wear a bikini i i guess i mean my mom wore one so mm -hmm. she wasn't gonna she wasn't gonna give it up um but i i think it mostly just meant that distributed amongst our church was just a ton of focus on the family james dobson that all the parents gobbled up and exchanged amongst amongst each other and james dobson ruled my childhood for the most part Ew. Um, and it was very, it was very scarring. <laughs> yeah. What this things do you remember? Um, um, I remember being told that we had to hug the toilet to get spanked. Yeah. Okay. I remember you. Yes. I remember you talking about this. Why? Why? Yeah. Why? why? What? What? Does I it guess it was, it was so that children couldn't like put their hands behind them to get, you know, to avoid the spanking. Um, but why the was, toilet? You could do, you could hug anything. Was it meant know. to be like demeaning? Was it meant to be like, you're a, to you're a toilet person. You know, you're guys, a little turd I, human. I, I don't know. I didn't read whatever my parents read <laughs> that right. made this a good idea. But as a parent now myself, it's like the worst possible thing you could do to a child. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would definitely call that Number shit one, So you don't make your kids hug the child while you're spanking them? I don't spank my children, <laughs> yeah, guys. Here. Oh, what? Same here. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that was definitely one of the worst things. Uh, purity culture was just really damaging and prominent. Yeah. You know, my, my body, I grew up believing my body was shameful. I'm just going to tempt all my brothers if I'm showing too much skin. But then somehow we were allowed to wear bikinis and that was, that was different. I don't know. Everything kind of contradicted itself. 
Hmm. So I felt very confused. I'm realizing that like, like, like I knew that James Dobson was, you know, I like, he was part of my childhood and I read some of his stuff and my parents read his stuff and it was all really weird and bizarre and like resulted in, you know, fairly like ishy parenting practices slash adolescent, you know, like me trying to learn to be a, an adolescent human, right? But it's, like, really pervasive. Like, I mean, I, I knew it was pervasive, but it's, like, almost everybody that grew up in church in the 90s was subject mm-hmm. to that crazy shit. Yeah. Or in the, in, or in the yeah. 80s, late 80s, 90s, like... And it's still, like, a lot of people are still into it, but I feel like it's it's, it's sort of on the downturn at this point. Like, it's not as, nearly as prominent as it used to be. Uh, yeah, well, I'm... I'm you know, with him being such a supporter of Trump and everything, I think people have kind of realized how bullshit he is. Yeah, yeah. Or double down on his, uh, on his, you know, teaching or whatever. But he, I yeah. mean, the whole reason he rose to power was because of Jerry Falwell in the, the like, uh, the family oriented, like, Republican Party. Uh, you know, that was like a really big thing in the 90s was mm. like the family, like, focus on the family, like, uh, Oh, there's another phrase for it. There's like a big, there's like a big prevalent political phrase for it, but I can't think of what it is, and it's going to drive me crazy. Anyway, yeah, ethnocentrism. It was a <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh, anyway, sorry, Jesse James Dobson. Oof. Yeah, good God. All right, what other like things do you remember from growing up in church and how your family behaves and everything like that? Um, I remember salvation paired with baptism were a very big, it was a very big deal. Uh, as a super young kid, I remember feeling the pressure of that. I remember feeling like I was disappointing my parents and I was disappointing my pastor or my Sunday school teacher. Uh, disappointing because how? I was a very shy child oh. and we, at my church, you, there was an altar call every Sunday. Mm-hmm. Every Sunday. Oh, yeah. So the Baptist, the, you have to. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. And the pastor, you know, would stand. And it was it was obvious that he knew who needed to come forward. And so he would, like, stare you down. Oh, my God. And <laughs> I remember my I went on a camping trip with my family. I was probably five or six. And my mom sat me down on a log. And, you know, we, we prayed the prayer of repentance as a five-year-old, I just repeated mm-hmm. everything she said. Um, but it was, it felt very led by her. It didn't, it wasn't like I was very inquisitive because all it, it all it meant to me was I'm going to have to walk down the aisle and everyone's going to stare at me. I don't want to do that. You know, like I don't want everyone staring at me, no matter what this means, heaven or hell, I am not walking down that aisle. I'm too shy. I'm too, I, you know, this isn't my thing. But I remembered my parents like putting so much pressure on the whole concept like of heaven and hell to a five year old. And so I prayed the prayer with my mom uh, um, in on this camping trip. And then that following Sunday, it was expected. And I remember she dressed me real fancy. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm, not I'm not like a fancy girl. I've never been a fancy girl. Uh-huh. She would buy me these white socks that you fold over and there's like this little lace tutu um, <laughs> around your ankle. Your ankle had a, like a white lace tutu. Yeah, I had those. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. I, well, even as a little girl, I would cut off the lace. Mom oh, yeah. would have a fit. Yeah, she'd have a fit because she'd be like, I paid so much money for those. And I'd be like, I don't like the lace. Anyway, she put me in those socks, I remember. And I didn't have time to cut the lace off. And we're sitting in the church service and it's over and everyone's looking at me knowing, you know, that Jesse had given her life to Jesus on a camping trip and that she needed to walk down the aisle and profess her faith publicly. That is, that's so weird. Oh, wow. That's so weird. Like, that's so every, like, yeah. like don't like, you have like something all... better? To, can't you go watch football or something? You know, like yeah. <laughs> why need to watch this little girl, like be terrified anyway, go on. Yeah. All, all eyes are on me. And, you know, I've, I'm probably sweating like a pig and 
Meanwhile, my dad's mom, my granny Opal, gets up and walks down the aisle instead of me. And no one saw it coming. <laughs> and she's like sobbing. And, and everyone's like turns their eyes and they're like, oh. and then my, you know, and then everything shifted. And I was like, whew, thanks, Granny Opal. Right. Granny took, Opal. Took the, heat, took the heat off of me. Um, <laughs> no one saw then, it coming. But my mom was like, my mom said to me later, she, she was like, you know, just because Granny Opal walked down the aisle today, it, you still have to do it next week. <laughs> and I just remembered being like, man. <laughs> And the whole, it just ruined your whole week. And you were five. Your whole you little five? five-year-old week. Thinking of like the pressure of a five-year-old though, because you know, my son, he is five. And, oh, yeah. um, and how easy it is to make them believe literally anything. I mean, my son, um, he wasn't eating his chicken one day. He wasn't eating his chicken strips. So I had my, I changed my friend's contact information on the phone and I had him call in with a voice and uh, Batman's picture popped up. And I'm like, hey, Hilo, Batman's on the phone for you. And my friend told him to eat his chicken. To this day, my son, my son thinks that I'm personal friends with Batman. <laughs> of and course. he's and he's five and a half. So I'm just thinking of like how genuine do we really think that these conversion or did we really think these conversion experiences of five year olds were? Like yeah. what sins were you repenting of, Jesse? Exactly. I don't, I don't know. And then being Southern Baptist, there was the expectation that I was going to climb up in the baptismal with a man in a white gown in front of this crowd of people. Um, when you were like that, it's really creepy. Exactly. Which I was like, no, that's a no, that's going to be a no. Uh Um, I lived on a lake and my grandfather was an Episcopal priest and so he wore like a white collar and right. um, all of that. And I had a great relationship with him. We didn't, you know, we didn't go to the same denomination church, but I remember saying, um, like bel- understanding he was like a pastor in a way. And I told my parents, I was like, if I have to get dunked, I want it to be in the lake in my backyard by my grandfather. Cause I know him. Hmm. Um, and then, so then how are they going to say no to that? Well, yeah. they didn't, you know, right. they didn't, they didn't say no, we've got it on VHS and we have yes. the part at the beginning where I'm having a fit because I want to wear my bikini in the lake <laughs> and, and my mom's throwing an oversized white t-shirt on me before, <laughs> before I go down into the lake. Um, yeah you were you cannot be baptized in a bikini (laughs) you were jesse you were your your rebellion that continued on into college right like you were that it only got worse after that oh (laughs) college um yeah i i made a mistake i grew up in public school like I, i i was very involved in my church but i did go to public school and feel grateful for that. Very grateful, actually, because I experienced a lot. I learned a lot about life, I think. And I, I look back on it in, in hindsight and I'm grateful. My parents, well, really, they just didn't have money to send me to any kind of private Christian school. And I'm, I'm glad, you know, I think it helped me be better socialized, honestly. Um, but because of it, I decided oh, when I go to college, I'm going to go to a Christian college and, you know, make up some time because I went to public school my whole life. Like, I don't know, somehow in my 18 year old brain, it was a great idea. Uh Like, oh yeah, I'm going to go to a Christian college. And of course my parents, I'm going to undo all the sin that got in me from all that public school. (laughs) Totally. Um, all, all the making out on the church playground, Mm, um, mm, mm, that mm. happened in high school. Um, yeah, I was at youth group. I just don't remember what they talked about. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I went to a very small Christian conservative, like missionary kind of college mm-hmm. in Georgia. And um, that was like v- pretty immediately a big mistake. And I, s- I stuck out like a sore thumb. And... Uh, I got into a lot of trouble. I skateboarded in the hallways. Mm. I initiated the 
you know, all the cafeteria trays when it snowed and we slid down the hill and got in trouble for that. Are you um, Bart Simpson? What is going on here? <laughs> oh, yeah. You were Bart. You were basically Bart. That's pretty cool. You get, you're like a, yeah, a missionary Bart Simpson. Yeah. Well, there was like, there was one whole floor in my dorm where the girls had like a bun and an ankle length skirt. And like a cardigan, like almost all the girls, I think it was like the first floor. Um, I don't know. Maybe they were Mennonite. I never asked. Um, (laughs) Put, um, you know, those pop rocks that you like throw on those fireworks, you like throw it on the ground and it explodes. Uh Did you put it? I put them under the toilet seat. seat. Oh my yeah, God, Jesse, you, you are and Bart then I, Simpson. Good, good. <laughs> and then I, I like sat, I was so bored. It was such a miserable school <laughs> and it was so easy to get a rise out of everyone. Um, she was yelling you, out like, eat my skirts. I seem to remember it from your notes or something. Didn't you start kind of a, didn't you start a bit of a revolution there? <laughs> well, I tried. I definitely tried. Did you, you, um, you didn't succeed? So we, <laughs> No, I got in trouble. So we we had we had a policy. We had to go to chapel every day. It, they, there was chapel at like Monday through Friday, um, and it was a good forty minute chapel. So it's really awful. And then on top of our forty minute chapel, we were also required to attend a local church in the town. And we had to go to a Wednesday night service. We had to go to a Sunday morning service. And then we either went to like a Sunday night or you had to be a part of some Bible study or, you know, small group, something like that. And what we would do is when we went to chapel every day at the school, they, we had like a sign in where you had to sign in and they kept track on whether you were there or not. And, you know, and you weren't after, paying anybody off to sign you in for to sign you in. We tried lots of methods. <laughs> we really did. And because there were there were like three kids in the whole school with different, you know, like crazy colored hair, yeah. which would have been me and then my two friends. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they knew, you know, oh, if it's one of these three crazy kids in a band t-shirt and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, vans, don't let them sign each other in. <laughs> Um, right also like like all they have to do is is like stand on a chair and look around and be like nope they're not here they're not here everybody's hair is normal right (laughs) or in a bun so anyway Uh, sorry uh, yeah so we did yeah we did try to you know pretend like we were in chapel but it, it was only effective maybe one or two times um so they they started this policy where they said they made some school announcement and they were like, we're starting a new attendance policy where you have to go, you know, uh, five days a week to chapel and do your Wednesday night church, Sunday morning church, and then some type of small group. And you need to fill out a piece of paper and have your pastor or your small group leader sign it saying that you're actually at these places that you are claiming to be attending. And if, if you don't attend X number a month, then we're going to charge you a fee and then the money we make from your church attendance or their lack of, we're going to use that money for summer mission trips. Whether you're the person going on the mission trip or not (laughs) is irrelevant. (laughs) We're just going to take all your money um, from, from our, you 18 year old college students. We're going to take your money and we're going to put it into missions. Um, so being, the proper uh, punk rock that I was, I decided to make posters <laughs> because I was like, oh, fuck that. Right, right, right. So I made these posters and they cut, you know, I cut out letters and stuff. So it, it almost looked like, you oh, know, right, some uh, note. Uh, yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it was cool. It sounds it's cool. like, I mean, yeah, that's like what was, that's like what was punk rock then was ransom note style text i mean this was like Hmm. 99 this was 99 that was the that was the apex of of punk rock being in like the mainstream you know it's like blink 182 and and some 41 five iron frenzy Frenzy. that's all i know (laughs) anyway yeah so i okay i made these posters and they were super cool i thought and they said 
my church attendance is not a fundraiser um, in so many words. And I hung them around school. Uh, you know, boys and girls were not allowed in the other genders dorm. But of course, I had to hang up posters in the boys dorm, you know, Mm -hmm. I had to. So I ran through <laughs> with a roll of scotch tape and all my posters. Yes. Wait, wait did you skate through? Because <laughs> I, I really too. hope that you skated through. <laughs> Maybe I did. Let's, yeah. let's imagine I did. Okay, good. Do you skate it through? Flipping everybody off and spray paint. I'm totally Bart Simpson. Yeah. Yep. Never even considered that. Uh, yeah. And then it w it only took like an hour, maybe like an hour before the dean <laughs> called me into the office <laughs> because who else would have done this? <laughs> only me. That is perfect. You're no notorious. But you know, I, I do think, you know, you say, did you start a revolution? I do know that they changed the policy. Hey. Um, because he realized that. So you won. It, it was. Yeah, I guess I did. You, yeah. you won. You might have gotten in trouble, but you won. If you were going to die tonight, do you know where Stop. you... Stop. Just tell them about our website. Oh, just tell them to go to thelifeafter.org? Yes, they can go now, even without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> thelifeafter.org. We have a blog, contact page, a link to our Facebook page, and more. All right, thelifeafter.org. Heavenly. And we're back. You're listening to The Life After. I'm Chuck Parson. Brady Harden. And I, <laughs> Brady Harden. And we're here with our friend Jesse. Uh, so, Jesse, you uh, rebelled all through college. Um, you slid out of there as quickly as you could. You didn't, You lasted how long? Six months or something? It, yeah. Later, skaters. <laughs> That's, hey, you know, <laughs> you made a really good decision for yourself there. Um, so I'm really curious about how you went from being a Southern Baptist to being, to finding yourself knee deep in charismania, because that's some, that's a big move there. It is a big move. Um, uh, why does anyone make big moves in <laughs> Christianity? They think they're in love. Yep. I met someone and fell in love with him. He was very charismatic, grew up pretty charismatic. Uh, and while we're dating, he said, he told me one day, he said, the Lord told me that we are supposed to go to this particular church. And I just remember being completely confused by that statement, the Lord told me, because that wasn't something I'd ever heard growing up. And he, you know, he, he laughed and shrugged it off and was like, well, yeah, the Lord told me. And I still was like, I don't understand. You uh, read this in the Bible. Right. That is the word. That That's, is the word of God. Uh, yeah. um, and anyway, so we go to this church and upon entering this charismatic church, it maybe had 50 people, maybe a hundred people max. So it was very small. Um, there's a bunch of barefooted feral children running around. There are people with flags and tambourines. Yes. It was, it just felt like total chaos. And you were like, I'm, I'm at home right now. This is exactly where I belong. No, <laughs> I, I was like, I need to get the hell out of here. Uh -huh. And, but we walk in and the, the older, the elders of the church, had grown um had grown up with this guy i was seeing he he ended up becoming my husband and now he is my ex-husband um but he they knew him since he was a child and so he, they were all very warm and welcoming to him and then of course they see me a man walks up to me and he be basically begins to prophesy over me this is my initial you know introduction into all of this is, this is literally your first like, time there yes yeah and i'm i'm just in total shock by all of it what did he uh, say 
Uh, well, he asked me to hold my hands out, palms up. Okay. And 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 then he asked if he could put his hand on my shoulder. And, you know, I am kind of freaking out, but I looked over my shoulder at my boyfriend. And, I, and he was like, it's okay. You know, like, it's fine. Um... <laughs> and so you uh, got your uh you got your vicarious consent to have this man touch you i did yeah like it's okay you're gonna be fine um and he you know the man at the the language that they use is that he got a download from the lord about me for my life (laughs) that's Um, like hold on can i i just want to freeze frame that for a second because i love when old church people or middle-aged church people try to like talk to to young people <laughs> using like <laughs> using their language. This happens all the time. It's like it's getting like, drunk and reading like, the word on the street. Like they're at you know they're talking to their wife and they're like you know I think I really think that I I would be good with the youths you know <laughs> and <laughs> so they end up saying things like that because they think on some level they're in touch and I there was so the first time that I went to a charismatic church i had a similar experience where uh i i was like you know there with my friend and we were just goofing off and drawing pictures the whole time and like showing them to each other and cracking up and not really paying attention to what was happening and then after the the service was over i'm sort of like there's a moment where i'm like i'm on my own you know i don't have my buddies to like cling to and this this really bizarre like middle-aged dude that was like a little scruffy looking and and was like trying to, I I could tell he was trying to look a little younger than he actually was. He literally pinned me up against a wall. Like he didn't push me, but he like approached me in such a way that I backed up and he keeps getting closer and I'm backing up and he's like six inches from my face. Oh my God. And I'm like, this is uncomfortable. And I'm just (laughs) like, Hey man, you know, I'm like 13. I don't know how to react to this. 14 probably. Oh. And he's like, he's like, hey, you want to be radical? Because I was like, you know, a punk rock. I was like a punk rock kid. I was like, you know, I was for like you. Like I was wearing like black Jinko jeans and had spiked hair and probably had like a bunch of bracelets on and listened to Linkin yeah. Park, you know. And he's like, you want to be radical? And then, you know, something, something, Jesus. Yeah, that's radical. Yeah, that's radical, you know. And I'm just like, do you think people say radical still? You know, <laughs> Is that? It's what, a, what do you mean? I like to picture. I don't want to be radical. I don't know what you mean by that. I don't surf. <laughs> like, <laughs> I like to imagine that when Eugene Peterson writes the word, that he puts a hat on backwards. <laughs> <laughs> And he, and then he like, uh, he has like a Toby Mac poster that has a touchstone, and he just touches it. <laughs> And then proceeds to continue writing. Exactly. All right, anyway, Jesse, I'm sorry. So you're you're about to get prophesied over. He did, yeah. He so he um, gave me his download from the Lord. Uh, a, another <laughs> phrase. Another phrase is, uh, "Oh, he read your mail." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Jimmy a, that's, that a, that's a common one. That. That's yeah. a common one. Yeah. That one's pretty common. And you know, it was interesting because. At the time, nothing like this had ever happened to me, and um, I my initial reaction walking into the whole thing was, I don't like this. I feel uncomfortable. This looks weird. This feels weird. How could this be church? Um, but he ended up saying some things. He he called me a Narnian queen. He said, "Oh, he said the Lord calls you a Narnian queen." Is that an and insult? Then, like that? Yeah, like he called you the Ice Queen? No, well, he, then he said, you know, like Lucy. He called you Tilda Swinton? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Not the Ice Queen. Okay, um, okay. A Narnian queen. Yeah, uh, just like, a generic like one. Lucy. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. Except okay. you didn't have to hit puberty twice. Right, poor Lucy. <laughs> the poor first time was a bully. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and then he said something. Oh, he, he said, uh, the Lord calls you the mother of princes. Which, okay, you know, I don't know what that means. Um, Which is another way of saying queen, I think. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is just another way to say queen. Um, and then he said something about, you know, uh, the, and the Lord is pleased with that you care for other people's children. Which I was in, co- I transferred when I, when I left the small Christian school, 
I transferred to um, a big university and I was studying education to become a teacher. And so I remember feeling like, whoa, weird. How does he know I work with people's children? Um, and, and, you know, still to this day, he didn't know me. He didn't know anything about me. Literally, I walked into the door of that church and he met me for the first time. So right. I'm, I still feel somewhat confused, yeah. but it made an impression on me for sure. Uh-huh. And when we left and we're riding in the car and I asked, I, well, I think I accused my boyfriend of being like, why did you tell that man about me? <laughs> and he was like, what are you talking about? And I said, how did he know that I work with kids? Why did he say those things to me? And he was like, I don't know what he said to you. I, I've never told him anything about you. And so then I like stopped asking questions and my brain was just like, wait, what? How is he psychic? I don't understand. Hmm. So it was enough. It intrigued me enough to where I was <clears> like, I'll, I guess I'll go back, you know? And that began my journey into the charismatic world. We, we stayed at that church for probably three years, uh, and then we got married, and then we transferred. T- uh, he was a worship leader, and, and I ended up joining up with that, and I play keyboard and sing, so I also became a worship leader. Um, we ended up at a bigger church, which had several services. They, video, they put everything on video. And you could purchase the videos, which then later ended up being accessible on the internet. Um, I'm not going to tell you where you could potentially watch me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> At least not on the air. As a worship leader. <laughs> um, uh, links will did, be included in the, the show notes. description. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I got, I really got, I, I really dove into the the dance the interpretive dance i did a lot of um which you had to be real careful because you know you can't show your midriff if you're on stage yeah you gotta tuck it in you we had to wear layers right and and there had to be like the long layer and then you could wear a shirt on top of like the long tank top and then you had to duct tape a piece of fabric to your to your torso (laughs) yeah basically (laughs) Just couldn't show any of your skin. Ah, belly button. I've stumbled. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, and then we had that. So the bigger church that I, that we were at for a long time, they had like prophetic booths. They did prophetic training and teaching. They had a full blown ministry school that students from all over the world came to, uh, every six months or something like that. And, and it was cool. I met a lot of neat people everybody was on the same page, but it was a bubble. It was totally a bubble. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what existed outside of that bubble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because I got so, I, I got so engrossed in it and the teachings were so intense by, by the leadership at the church, lots of teachings on favor and how if these, you know, if there's not a bunch of money in your bank account or you're not being upgraded to first class on an airplane, you are not, you're not <laughs> receiving favor. Um, well, but, what, what? Yeah. Like not like so, nonsense. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so what, I mean, what do you, what, if you're a, so if you're a devoted member of that church, that's like, that's like poor, what do you do with that? What do you do if you fly coach? Then you're you're not exercising your faith enough, and then and you need to repent, and you need to probably go up and get prayer, and find out what's blocking. Like there has to be some kind of blockage. Maybe it's a generational curse. Maybe it's your own sin. There were all the reasons. They they always had reasons and answers for why right. you're not thriving. Oh, you're not thriving. You don't have. Uh, you don't make six figures or you don't so you, oh, oh, what i'm hearing what i'm hearing is like a really powerful uh system for manipulation where you have this pastor who apparently makes six digits apparently i guess flies first class is, yes. is that like oh, a thing yeah. no no he has his own plane 
He has his own plane. Oh shit! So he always yeah. flew first class. Okay, so so he has he uses things that are convenient to him to to show people that he's holier and more spiritual than them. So For he sure. so he would stay. So he would maintain his power position, and it, he he also used things that were virtually unattainable for everybody else in the congregation, so that they would keep chasing a dangling carrot, basically. Oh, for sure. And he he called himself a prophet, and there was a season that he prophesied the bird flu, um, mm. and and like sold food and shelter to people when the bird flu hit because we were all going to get really sick. He prophesied that everyone need, was going to need the shelter and the food that, that his Wait, church did, would So be did he providing. call it before bird flu was on the news or did he, was he just like, Hey, bird flu, it's going to get real bad. <laughs> uh, no, no, it was on the news. Okay. <laughs> uh, how long was the transition between because you're you're an intelligent person and i know that like when we when we look back at the things that we believed it seems absurd but at the time it did not obviously right. right so like how long was that transition between you being kind of being skeptical to the guy knowing some information about you and then now kind of like jumping in like how long did that transition between like kind of like your southern baptist thinking of being kind of like um, cautious of these things to when you're kind of jumping in with both feet? No, that's a good question. Uh, I, I was cautious still for a while, but I didn't let on. I like, I didn't let people know. I think for those three years at that smaller charismatic church, I felt more like an observer. I was trying to figure it out. I was trying to see how real it maybe was or wasn't. And what ended up happening, I think what sold me is that the people were good people mm -hmm. and I, I trusted them. I came to feel like they were my community and I'm actually still friends with lots of them now. And they're, they were a good solid community of people. And so to me, it didn't line up. How could they be such great people? And they're so caring and loving and giving. And yet all of this be bullshit. Like, mm -hmm. It was difficult to combine all that, even though my brain was kind of telling me, this is weird and silly and strange, but these people are really good people. Mm. Um, and that felt, that felt really conflicting. And so for the most part, I just came and sat and watched. Um, but I do remember, I remember a moment at that specific church where someone was like, why don't you go up to the front and get prayed for? Which wasn't something I'd ever done in my whole life. You know, if you go up to the front, it's because the pra the pastor wants to like showcase you like, you know, you're a show dog and show, show you off to the congregation that you've given your, your life to Jesus and you're going to get baptized ne next Sunday. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was like, what's the steal? Like go up at the end of a service. I didn't understand. They're like, you just go up to the altar and someone will come pray for you. Um, and I remembered feeling, anyway, I did it. And it was a very, very, very vulnerable thing to do. And when I did go up there and someone just, a woman came and put her hand on my back and I cried, you know. Um, and that did something. It felt like, oh, I belong and I, someone cares about me. Someone put their hand on me, they care about me. I don't actually even know why I'm up here and I don't know why I'm crying, but that seems to be what everyone does up here. Hmm. Um, and they called it the Holy spirit, you know? So it didn't make sense. No one really gave me any kind of answer that, that I could, I could logically understand. Uh, it, but it became the people and then these feelings, the feelings were good feelings. It felt like community. Wow. I, told, it felt I, like, with that. I totally relate. I totally relate. Yeah. That. Hmm. Like, oh, I'm accepted, period. It doesn't matter that I wear, <laughs> what'd, you, what'd you say, Chuck? That I'm wearing black Jenkos and <laughs> a, Link a Lincoln Park shirt. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> Which was close, um, close to what I was wearing then. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, it didn't matter. But for instance, at my parents' church, my parents transferred from Southern Baptist to Presbyterian. 
And there was no way in hell that I could go to church with them wearing whatever I wanted. Yeah. And so I think that was my, I think that was where I I drew a line and I was like, well, whatever Christian my parents are deciding to be now is disgusting and I would never want to go there. Um, but the, the, whatever this type of Christian is where everyone's barefoot and there's flags and donuts in the hallway and everyone kind of comes and goes out of the, the main community, you know, community hall, you know, no, no one cares if you sit down, no one cares if you stay the whole time, you can wear whatever you want. And then people come and like, give you a little back massage when you're crying on the altar. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is cool. I'll mm-hmm. hang out here. That totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, I did finally find a video of you uh, leading a worship. No, 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 I, no, no. I, I did. I googled "pretty woman sings shouts to the Lord." You're on, <laughs> you're on page eight hundred and forty-six. Uh, that, that but I, I do have a word that Chuck has a question uh, tr- for you. Trigger warning: shout to the Lord. <laughs> but I, um, so, I have a word that Chuck has a question. <laughs> Brady, how did you know? <laughs> Um, so, uh, so my, my whole thing with, and this is it, this is like a, uh, I feel like this is an ongoing debate within the, the post Christian community. Um, a lot of Christians that I know that went through the charismatic experience, look back and they're like, dude, some stuff happened that I can't explain. I don't really know. Like, how did that guy know that you worked with kids? Was it a was it a lucky guess? Was he really good at reading people? Like, what's the explanation for that? So, when you look back, wh- what was your experience like with, like with, like, prophecy and with healing and with, uh, you know, that kind of thing, like, like, demon possession, if that was, like, part of it? What, what kind of experiences did you have and what, what's kind of your takeaway? I mean, I know um, that's kind of a broad mm-hmm. question, but... I mean, I think with healing, I never saw anything. And there was a lot of prayer for healing. Uh I never saw people actually get healed. Mm -hmm. And that was difficult because I knew a lot of people who would go to the healing conference Mm -hmm. with, you know, a back and that was broke and they needed surgery. But they were like, I'm going to go to the healing conference first before I go to get my back surgery. Right. And then they'd they'd leave and their back was still fucked. So they had to go get their back surgery anyway. Yeah. But I think it was it was more than just, oh, I'm going to go to the healing conference because I do have faith and I do believe, which is the premise, you know, that's what they're telling you. You come here, you bring your faith, you bring your family and you bring your family's faith that your back is going to get healed and your back's going to get healed. And then when those people left and it wasn't, no one had any answers, you know, or they would bullshit and be like, you just didn't have enough faith. And so then you kind of leave feeling shitty too. And if it was someone, if it was someone I knew and loved, I never knew what to say to them either, you know, because I was like, I don't know. God works in mysterious ways. Right, (laughs) right. It's that, it's more of that dangling carrot kind of manipulation. It's like, yeah, there's healing. Oh, there's healing, but you got to have faith. You got to, you really got to have faith to get there. You know, our ways are not his ways. And all like all those were the blanket token responses to these people. If that verse wasn't in the Bible, there'd be so fewer Christians. (laughs) (laughs) His, our ways are not his ways, you know? Yeah. So that... (laughs) It's basically just saying, hey, in case nothing makes sense, I'm going to write this in here. It's like a catch-all bullshit it answer. Is, it yeah. is. It really is. the catch-all response. Don't worry that your life yeah. looks so, just like other people's. Uh, so yeah. you were, didn't you wind up on the, like, on the prophecy team or something? Well, I wouldn't say I was on the prophecy team, but I did go through a little bit of training. Uh-huh. Um, what did that look like? What was that like? Because this is like a kind of a foreign world to me. And I wonder like what the inner workings sort of look like, you know? Sure. You know, I don't think it's unlike, well, okay. So you, so you're going to meet with somebody, you know, and, and they would say, you want to talk to this person and make them feel warm and welcome. And then you want to, if you can hold their hands or put your hand on their shoulder or something like that. Um, and then you focus all your energy, you close your eyes, focus all your energy on a prayer where you're asking the Lord, Lord, how do you, you know, God, how do you feel about this person? What is it you want to say to them? And, and then, you know, you just close your eyes and some, maybe like magic happens and you, you just wait 
and see if you see pictures behind your eyes while your eyes are closed or you hear a word or you see a color or um so the rules were if there was ever anything negative that you saw if you saw death or you saw you know something horrible you you were not you were never supposed to say that to this person because uh, the person's right. coming to the church or to the service or to the conference or whatever it was and they're looking for a good word from the lord because god is good and god is love and that's those are the messages he's wanting to send his people via the prophets right right yeah <laughs> then why is he giving you all these other images yeah, well, yeah, but it, are they from God? That's the question. Um, that now I'm getting I'm, now like I'm, um, I'm getting like the the uh, guy from the Fruit Loops commercial, but he's in, like in a graveyard and he's just like tearing into a corpse. You know, like you're not supposed to say stuff like that. No, mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> like Toucan Sam. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh man, I was picturing the Lucky Charms guy, but I said Fruit Loops. Anyway. Oh, okay, gotcha. You know, I mean, you just never know. You never knew what was going to happen. Sometimes, sometimes people would get, a, well, I'll say the first time that I ever went into a prophetic booth before my training or anything, I was wearing this vintage Batman belt, um, to hold up my baggy pants. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the lady, you know, was like, what's your name? Have you ever had prophetic ministry before? Told her my name was Jesse. No, I've never had prophetic ministry. So she's like, okay, can I hold your hands? Close her eyes. And then she, she goes, I just feel like the Lord is calling you like a superhero. Um, <laughs> like you, <laughs> I just feel like you, you know, you're like Batman. Like the Lord <laughs> sees you that you're like Batman and Batman didn't have in and of himself any of his own superhero powers. Everything was about his tools. It was all about his gear. And she's like, and I'm at this point. That's, that's pretty good, uh, to be honest. I'm, it's pretty good improvisation. I'm like, no, this really happened to me. Oh, no, no. I mean, yeah, I mean, on oh, her oh, part, for her, right? For her. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, she was trained. She was trained. Right. She was trained. So, um, <laughs> she's like racking her brain. Time, <laughs> Sorry, um, go ahead. But I like have one eye open, you know, like, is this lady for real? I'm wearing a Batman belt. Like, right, I can't right. believe yeah. this is what she's going to go for. <clears throat> you know, <laughs> this is such a joke. Um, but that, but that's basically what, how they would train everybody. They, right. That's how they trained people was like, if you, d if you don't really get anything from the Lord, you try to say something really nice. So if, for instance, you didn't get a download from the Lord, you didn't, you know, God didn't show you somebody's <laughs> mail, you had to, you had to try to say something nice. Like, um, the Lord loves you. He sees you, you belong, you know, uh, right. all those things you're, you're chosen, you're called the next season of your life is going to be a beautiful harvest. Sure. Like all of that. So it could be like, it's just, you're literally just making up nice things. Like there's no, there's no ground to it at that point. Like if you, if you don't have a word from the Lord, that is right. Sure. Yeah. You, then you, you know, you find scripture, whatever, sure. you find a some type of positive scripture that you His can. His ways are higher than your ways. Yeah. Uh, we need to take a break. Another break. I would love to talk about uh, charismatic uh, bullshit all day, but. <laughs> we gotta move forward alright hey Chuck remember tithing uh, you mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. How's that? Patreon. It's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. 
Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. <laughs> and we're back. This is the life after. I'm Jesse. Brady. And Chuck. That was really good. That was much better. You're right. That was better. I like yeah. that. Um, so Jesse, let's, uh, let's get into your deconstruction and what led up to that. Right. Uh, it's sort of, mm-hmm. uh, would it be fair to say it, it, sp- it spans several years, right? So there's no like one particular, um, event, but there were sort of like, I feel like there were three sort of major, ev- like, uh, like life events that were kind of traumatic that led up to that. Um, yeah. al- as- along with like a, a general sort of like disillusionment with the language and the, in the culture and everything. Yeah, definitely. I I was really, you know, I was a part of the leadership of this. Um, so when uh, I got I got pregnant with my son, he's nine now, and my pregnancy went fine, you know. And and it wasn't until it was he was late, and um, uh, basically his his birth was, it was very complicated and labor went very long. And then there were some scary things that happened at the end that it, my, my hospital room went from my mother, my husband at the time, my midwife to all of a sudden there's literally like 15 people in my room, like nurses and doctors and Mm, specialists. mm -hmm. And when you look up (laughs) from, you know, your, your, birthing position and you look around the room, you're like, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Even though no one's really telling me how bad it it was or could have been. Right. They're just like, focus, you know, you're doing great, but they put oxygen on me. Oh yeah. But I knew it was scary. So when my son was born, he wasn't breathing. He had to be resuscitated. Um, but he came to and ended up, he was okay. And for me, <clears throat> I ended up having um, a pretty bad tear and needing surgery. It was like a four-hour surgery immediately after birth. Um, and then maybe 24 hours later, uh, my nurse asks me to, she's like, hey, you know, let's take your catheter out, get you in the shower. Uh, and I laughed at her. And she's like, what? And I was like, I can't, I can't feel my toes. Like, I can't move my legs at all. And she said, what do you mean? And I was like, I can't. She was like, here, wiggle your toes. And I couldn't. Mm. And so we basically discovered I was paralyzed from the waist down. Mm. Um, And, you know, they called in the neurologist. They called in the anesthesiologist. They called everybody in that they could call in. And no one could figure out what happened or what was wrong with me. So they didn't know if it was... Um, like permanent nerve damage that my nerves had been severed or if my nerves were just damaged and there's no, you know, cat scan that can tell you if your nerves have been severed or if they're damaged, they just said over time, you'll either you'll get better or you won't. Mm -hmm. Um, I was released from the hospital against medical advice, but ended up having to leave early because I didn't have health insurance and um, couldn't afford to stay longer than I guess I was there for maybe four or five days. But I went home in a wheelchair. Um, and I think the the realization hit me pretty quick. Um, this is not getting better. Um, and then the and then the shock of what happened. Why did God abandon me? Was my question. Um, why would this have happened? Why would my baby almost die? I needed a surgery for four hours and now I can't walk and no one can tell me if I'm ever going to walk again. Um, and I think what crossed my mind the most was I have literally spent my entire life like serving the Lord and praying and fasting and worshiping and dancing and praying in tongues, giving prophetic words you know, like if there's ever a moment where God would be present and protect me and my child, wouldn't this be the moment? Um, what happened? 
And, and I felt, I literally like was so, I was in such a traumatic place that I wasn't afraid to say that I was angry at God for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, 29 years old. And so to say that going from, you know, everything I've just shared about my whole life being a Christian and literally like I was the girl on stage singing and dancing, you know, use me, I'm a vessel, <laughs> you know, like I will go call me, I will go wherever you want me to go and I will serve you and love you. And you know, you'll protect me. And so this was this moment of, I don't understand. Apparently I lost so much blood. I needed two blood transfusions. Like uh, I almost died, Yeah, you know, my son almost died. And here I had all my friends who were also having babies within that same year. Most of them had home births and everybody's fine. Like nobody had surgery. Nobody was paralyzed. Nobody's baby had to be resuscitated. And so it was this like very strange moment for me personally to, and, and, and I didn't know like what victimhood was or any of that. I learned all that language and counseling. Um, but over time, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll tie that story up cause there's two more, but over time, <laughs> my, um, my nerves did heal, which means they didn't sever. Right. Um, they were just damaged by where the baby's head was during this part of labor where he basically got stuck on a nerve, mm. um, and damaged the nerves so severely mm. that I couldn't walk. Um, mm. So it took maybe six to nine months before I had full mobility again. Um, and, and during that time, you know, I have a newborn baby and I was basically at home mostly by myself because my husband worked. And that was, it was just such a time to fall in love with my child, but then also to be like, what the hell happened? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, why hasn't, why hasn't this ever happened to anyone ever that I've ever heard of? And the, all the doctors I saw, I saw a neurologist. I saw, I got CAT scans. I got MRIs. I did everything for like months. Um, all the doctors were literally like, we've, I've never seen anything like this in my whole life. Mm. Um, mm. And so I remember um, feeling, I felt like a freak. Mm. I felt, I felt like I had been abandoned. Um, and I, and it was the first time I ever had this like bubble in my chest of literally feeling like, I'm angry with God. If God is what I've believed he is all these years of my life, then why me? Why did he not show up? Why was I not protected? What happened to this favor? You know, I've been told I have because I've had faith my whole life. Um, so something was awry <laughs> mm -hmm. in, in, in the, the whole story. Something was wrong. Um, so it, you know, six to nine months, I'm finally able to walk. I'm getting feeling back in my legs. It was still hard to squat. I couldn't do stairs without holding onto a hand railing. Um, and then, <laughs> um, I'm determined to never have another child ever again. I was on birth control and not involved in anything that could make a baby. Um, because my, <laughs> all my, bo my body was still healing. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then it was literally like a one time situation. Um, but I was on birth control and I was nursing my son, which when you're nursing, you don't ovulate right? or so they say. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, uh, around my son was probably 10 and a half months old. I pee on a magic stick and it says I'm pregnant again. Hmm. Um, and I lost my mind Yeah. because of all everything. And I thought if I have to give birth again, I'm, it'll, I'll probably die. Like it would kill me. Right. Um, my, my baby wasn't even one year old yet. Wow. <sighs> so at that, that's when I, uh, signed up to go to counseling for the first time in my life yeah. because I was so scared to to have another baby. I was so scared to give birth, be pregnant, all of it. Um, and so I started seeing a counselor, which 
I'm a huge, huge advocate for mental health and for everyone going to counseling. And I hate that there's a shame stigma stigma on it. Um, because it, it nearly saved my life being able to go to Mm. counseling. Mm -hmm. Um, but I started seeing a counselor. It was great. She helped me go through every month of pregnancy and realize, you know, well, this is happening. There are ways to avoid the type of birth you had before, namely a C-section is what you need to schedule so that this type of thing does not ever happen to you again. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I was preparing myself and I was probably in my second trimester. I go to find out that, you know, what the baby is going to be a boy or a girl. And it's that exciting reveal moment. Um, And so my mom came and, you know, the ultrasound technician, she took a long time and I felt a little bit like, Either this, la- either this lady's just kind of a bitch because she's not really talking to us or something's wrong mm. um, because it felt weird. It didn't feel like, oh, there's this, there's that. Oh, isn't that cute? Look how cute your baby is. Oh, it's a girl. Okay, you get to leave. Like it felt like mm. it was just taking forever and it didn't feel light at all mm-hmm. um, because it wasn't. So she did tell us it was a girl. We were really excited, you know my first baby's a boy. And, um, and then she says, you know, the doctor would like to meet with you privately, um, about an issue. And so I was like, wait, what doctor sits me down. She says, you know, what you want to see in an ultrasound for your baby at this age is like a cross symbol in their heart that represents the development of the four chambers of the heart. And she said, we tried every angle and we did not see four chambers in your baby's heart. And so the room goes black for me. My head is spinning and I'm like, I don't know what this means. And she basically says, I've scheduled you an appointment first thing tomorrow morning with a specialist to get another ultrasound, um, a 3d ultrasound with color, you know, a real fancy thing. And you need to go because there's something wrong with your baby's heart. You know, no one expects to be told there's something wrong with your baby. Um, And then in light of everything I'd already gone through with my first pregnancy, birth, and all like the aftermath of that, I go to the appointment, you know, sure enough, end up meeting with a cardiologist after that, they give me a diagnosis. And I have to continue well, they, they asked me if I would like to terminate the pregnancy, um, at that appointment. Um, and I think I passed out Mm. on the table. Mm -hmm. My mom went and got me some juice. Um, and they kept asking me, what do you want to do? You know, what do you want to do? Do you want to get an amniocentesis? Do you want to study, you know, see if there's other things wrong with your baby? And I, all all I remember saying was, I just want to go lay on the beach. That's all I want to do. We're like, no, 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 Jesse, you need to answer these questions. We have very important paperwork you need to sign. Mm-hmm. Do you want the amniocentesis? I was like, no, I just want to go lay on the beach. Mm. Um, like I couldn't You're comprehend. Dissociating with mm-hmm. the situation. Yeah. yeah. Disassociating. So I didn't, you know, I didn't do anything. I didn't have any tests done that day. Um, I did not terminate the pregnancy. And I just went that summer. Um, she was due, my baby was due in August and I went that summer. I had to see a doctor once a week to check me and then another doctor to check her. I had a C-section. Thankfully I was not paralyzed after that. Um, she was born and she had three major heart defects that she was born with. My daughter, um, had her first heart surgery when she was four days old. Wow. And she's seven now. She's doing great. Yay. She has, yeah, she's had <laughs> a total of seven heart surgeries. Um, and, you know, she essentially functions on a quarter of a heart. Mm. So she, everyone likes to ask, is she okay? So she's good to go now, right, Jesse? Like, everything's cool. Everything's going to be fine. Well, today, yeah, she's very healthy. And... We took a walk. We took our dog Pickle for a walk, and we we played Minecraft together. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, yeah, she's good today. 
I don't know what could happen tomorrow. And there have been unexpected things that have happened. So, um, throughout that journey with her and her life, literally at like all, all the rest that was maybe left, if I had anything left after my son's birth, my belief, my faith, do I believe God is a good God? Do I believe God healed my daughter? No, no. There were people who said, hey, can we come to the hospital and pray during her surgeries? And I remembered saying, sure, but I don't want to see you. And I don't want anything to do with your prayer. Like you can go to the, a different floor and pray somewhere else mm. um, if that's what you want to do. But this is this is my real life. And I can't bank I can't bank on God making this okay. Like I, 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 I embraced my daughter's surgeon. <laughs> I embraced him and kissed his hands mm -hmm. after he completed her heart surgeries wow. because, because he saved her life. Mm -hmm. You know, her, do her doctor, her surgeon saved her life. Um, that's it. It was him. Um, and everybody on the team and then all the, the care after all her surgeries and the medication. And, you know, I don't, I don't feel like, you know, God really had anything to do. Cause if, if God had something to do with my daughter getting well, then wouldn't God have had something to do with her not being formed correctly in my womb? You know, mm. like it's both, it's both. It would have to be both. <clears throat> Right. Um, if, if God gets the credit for healing some kids, but not healing others, well then who, who do you blame for my daughter being born with the heart defects in the first place, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, or the girl who calls me and says, did you know that I had a heart baby and she didn't survive her first surgery? And then of course I want to go, well, why, why did your baby die and mine lived? Like why, what kind of God would say, sure. Jesse's baby gets to live, but not hers, you know, yeah. her baby dies and now she's got a tattoo to remember her baby. What makes that okay? And you I know? think that like every denomination has a very specific answer to that. I mean, when I was Southern Baptist, we would say, you know, God does things in mysterious ways uh, during, or, but when I was like more like reformed, it'd be like, well, he does it for his own glory or, you know, we don't know what things he's going to teach. Really. None of those are, our answers at all. They're just, right. they're just a, you know, it, it, depending on what you put the most emphasis on in the Bible, whether it's um, Christ centric or people centric or whatever, that's going to determine your answer. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what was the, what was the last step then for you then? So the last was, um, it's probably the most difficult because a, as my interview with you guys is a bit of a coming out for me, a lot like this isn't a public thing that I've shared it was about two years ago. Actually, it'll be three years in May. Um, my dad, who has been my rock my whole life, um, a strong Christian man, a leader in his church, has carried my family, you know, bears the title of our spiritual head um, of our family. My dad um, attempted suicide mm -hmm. in May. Um, May, 2015. And no matter how the story is told, you know, I, I've been in therapy for a long time. We have our, we have our, our narrative memory, mm -hmm. which is, it's the easy story to tell that we've told a couple times and it doesn't puncture <laughs> the, the, gross swamp of darkness and shit. Mm -hmm. Um, so I can say my narrative memory of the event, you know, um, but I, it changed me forever. Mm. I'll, I'll never be the same person again. And I'm still working through what it did to me yeah. and how difficult, how difficult it was. Yeah. And for my, for my whole family really. Um, but it was, uh, I, I mean, it's important to mention on, on this show because it was very twisted religiously, his reasons. Um, so, uh, my, br my brother and I intervened and we were able to, I mean, 
it was minutes. You know, we responded to some weird text messages he sent us. Mm. And had we not responded, had we not followed through, called each other, called a friend, ended up driving to his house, you know, he, he'd probably be gone. Mm -hmm. And that's really scary to think about. I don't know what type of relationship everyone else has with their parents, but sometimes your dad sends you a weird text message and you don't respond for a day because you're like, oh, dad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dad, that's weird. Yeah. Why'd you do that? Uh -huh. You know, what's, what, do you, what does he mean? What does he want? I don't know. I'm at a concert, which I was that night. I was at a concert. So it could have been really easy for me um, to just tuck my phone in my pocket and be like, I don't know, he's being weird. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't do that. And I responded, ended up, you know, interacting with my brother some. And eventually we sent someone over to his house because he and I were a good 30 minutes away, but we had a buddy who was closer. So we sent our friend over, he gets there, all the doors are unlocked, all the lights are on and no one's home but he finds, you know, suicide note. Mm. One, one with my brother's name, one with my name and one for my mother sitting on the kitchen counter. So mm. he tears into the envelope with my brother's name just to confirm that this is what he thinks it is. Mm -hmm. Reads it, calls my brother, my brother calls me. And of course we're like, it was, it was the most shocking, the most shocking thing to hear because if you know my dad, um, he's the, he's bubbly, he's social, he loves to be the center of attention. He doesn't know a stranger. Um, he loves God. He loves Jesus. <laughs> he will pray for you. He will give you the back, the shirt off his back. You know, he's, um, he's just, you wouldn't think that he was the type of person who would be capable of this. So, I don't know what to do. I'm panicking and I'm driving to his house and I'm able to, he answers the phone. I call him on my, on my cell phone and he picks up. And I think this is the part that made it so difficult. This is the part where mm. I'm just like, I can't go back to religion, you know, after mm. this moment in my mm -hmm. life, he is telling me he want he, like, I'm asking where he is, you know, dad, where are you? I, I'm driving to where you are. Let's get dinner. I'm, you know, I'm trying to fake him out. And he begins to talk about how he's just ready to go to heaven. Um, he's waited a long time. He, he, my dad's had some, he's always been really active in sports. So he's got a knee replacement, shoulder replacement and a hip replacement. And so he's just talking about how his body's deteriorating. He's ready for his new body. You know, I'm ready for my new body. I don't want to continue to get old and I don't want to be a burden to my family. Um, and it's just, it's just my time. Like I'm ready to see Jesus. Like I'm ready for my mansion and, um, everything's going to be fine. You're all going to be fine. Um, don't worry about me. I love you very much. And, uh, you know, but I'm literally panicking mm -hmm. on the phone, begging my father not to take his life, um, for a good 20 minute drive, just begging and and then it, he hung up on me so you know dad is alive um the police were able to track his phone and they found him um but it could have been minutes and you know nobody knows had we not responded or had the police not shown up when they did or whatever you know he he wouldn't be here mm -hmm. um he spent a week in the psych ward and then, or not quite a week, just under a week. And then he did some group therapy rehab for, um, like five weeks. He was diagnosed bipolar type two, which is uh, more manic than depressive. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's why it wasn't like, there weren't any red flags. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the manic behavior we just chalked up to dad's personality mm -hmm. like, Oh, that's just dad. Yeah. He, he, he likes to wake up at 4am and clean the whole house. That's just dad. Yep. Oh yeah. 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 He gets on his bike and he rides 25 miles every Sunday morning. 
that's just dad. It's it's hard not to it's hard to view that type of behavior as as abnormal or bad. It's like really good. Yeah. It's like oh, that's when you get stuff done, you know. Absolutely, and then especially because he'd be like, "The Lord woke me up at two a.m. Right. So you know, so I could read this book, and I finished it by eight a.m. Right, right, right. And we'd all be like, "Okay, yeah. aren't you tired? Yeah, yeah." Nope. Did, why can, can you not read at other times of the day? <laughs> um, yep. So, so the you know, I think the the good news obviously is that my dad is doing well. He's on medication. He's he's really he's really taken it into account how hard it was on our family, um, and he he understands what his mental illness is. Um, he's like really gone into learning about mental health and he's a big advocate for mental health awareness Mm. and I'm really proud of him. Um, on my end, you know, and everyone in my family has a different story. My mom, my brother and myself all handled it really differently. Um, for me though, it was, it was that it was, it was the end for me. It was my last straw. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I went through and cleaned the house out before my mom got home. My mom was out of the country on a mission trip when my dad did this. Um, so she was getting off an airplane while my dad's getting checked into the psych ward Mm, mm -hmm. and my brother, she's sitting on the tarmac and my brother and I have her on speakerphone to tell her, you know, basically what, what had happened. Mm -hmm. And so I had been, I had been advised to go through the house before she came home and just make sure there just wasn't anything weird, you know, like he didn't put something under her pillow or, um, write some kind of goodbye letter. Anyway, the house was littered with things that he had done. You know, he, he set up the whole week and got her a massage and like a manicure, pedicure. He wrote little notes and had gift cards to it. I mean, it was just like, he crossed every T and dotted every I, um, and had been planning this for months, which I think was, the hardest, one of the hardest, scariest things, but I was going through and I found in his office, his like daily planner. And on that day it was like circled and he wrote heaven with like four exclamation marks. Mm -hmm. Damn. And I, I, I I just lost my mind. I was like, Nope, no, we're done. This Mm -hmm. is, this is insane. Like literally this is insane. I can't, I can't do this anymore. And so since then, I, <laughs> I stopped seeing Christian counselors, which is what I was seeing before. Mm-hmm. And I immediately looked up, how do I find somebody with a doctorate in like psychotherapy? Because mm-hmm. there's a lot that I need work on. It isn't just what happened in this event. It's going to be the undoing of all of the ways that I've thought and believed mm-hmm. for, for so long. Yep. Um, and I, I just kind of want to be normal. <laughs> yeah. So I have spent the last uh, two and a half years really, really, really undoing and like deciding what I believe is true and real and authentic and what makes sense. You know, my parents are still very strong Christians. My brother and his family are very strong Christians. And, and that's fine, you know. If that's their security, that's where they find comfort. I'm not trying to change them. Um, but they're not, you know, they're not super thrilled about my not going to church anymore mm-hmm. and my, my disbelief. Um, and so it was, it was hard. And it's, it's hard, too, because there's a stigma on the mental health. So people who did know what happened with my dad, you know, nobody brought me a casserole. No, people didn't bring my parents casseroles. Mm-hmm. It was like... Somehow it was, he brought it upon himself or I don't know. It, it's just different. It was handled it, in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. But if someone in your church, you find out gets diagnosed with cancer, everyone signs up to bring them a casserole. Mm-hmm. But if someone in your church gets diagnosed with bipolar type two, it, it, you know, your phone stops ringing. No one's, no one's calling you. No one's asking how they can help. And that yeah. was my, that was my situation too. It was like, even even the people in my life who were still somewhat Christian, 
who still claim Jesus and maybe they don't go to church, but they still believe in salvation. They still believe in heaven and in being kind and good. Nobody showed up. Nobody called me. No one called to ask how I was doing. And so I re- it was it was like the most telling for me to feel I felt a lot of shame when I got divorced too. Mm-hmm. I felt like the Christian community didn't they they all said, "Oh, we just don't know what to say. We don't know how to be there, you know. Mm-hmm. We don't know what to do because you guys were leaders in the church together. So we just don't know. Nobody knows what to do, Jesse. Sorry." Mm-hmm. But meanwhile, he he was still very accepted in church. And so this to me felt like, well, it's all just happening again. You know, Mm -hmm. like, wait, I thought Christians were supposed to love you, especially in a crisis. Mm -hmm. And now you're proving over again how you can't and won't and aren't going to provide any type of support or community for me whatsoever. Um, And the plus plus side of all that is like, I'm very glad that your dad's okay. And obviously your kids, it's huge. Um, we do only have like a few more minutes left, mm-hmm. and, but you, you have found that community now. Yes. And um, can you give us like a two minute description of what you're doing now and kind of what your group is that you've been able to create in this new community? Yes. Um, so via the life after, hey, hey, um, hey. You, you all inspired me to realize that there were people out there um, like me, similar to me, or on the same trajectory as me. And I thought, oh my gosh, I wonder if I could find these people in my own city. And I did via social media. I, you know, sent out a red flare in the form of breakfast on a Sunday morning and uh-huh. I called it breakfast church. Yeah. And, um, and people responded and they actually showed up at my house. Uh-huh. And so I was like, I maybe have five eggs and a <sighs> box of Bisquick. Uh-huh. Um, but do you want to bring something? And I have coffee. Right. Um, and it, and it was amazing because there were these people who I didn't even know a lot of people I didn't even know. And they had all, very similar stories there. So we have, our group is pretty formed now. We've been meeting since, uh, October and five of us are divorced. If that's <laughs> yeah. telling at all, right? <laughs> there are three single moms all right. and, um, and then you know, the, every every Sunday is different, and we couldn't get enough of each other, so we started to also meet on Wednesdays and uh-huh. call it midweek. All right, uh, where we usually and, do and like wait, spaghetti wait, wait. Just, dinner. Just to be clear, like you, so you guys open with prayer, and then you have a reading, <laughs> and then you have some worship time. Is that pretty? So it's uh, it's what you might call very blasphemous, <laughs> and there is so much, <laughs> there is so much satire. Right, right, um, right. Our, our staunch atheist, he al- he does actually open saying that he has some unspokens. He would like, <laughs> he would like pray for. Shit. Uh, I have an unspoken. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so, the common theme is we're just human beings trying to be human beings together. And we like to eat breakfast. And none of us go to any type of organized religion for the most part. There are two people who still every now and then visit. Uh, an Episcopal church mm-hmm. and they, but yet we're, everyone is on a different place. We're all, we're all in various places because of our different life circumstances, but there's full acceptance and acknowledgement and love and we get in great arguments. It's kind of beautiful that Good. we we're eating bacon and having mimosas and, <laughs> you know, we're arguing about the concept of free will. <laughs> so the, ba- so the bacon is the body and yes. the mimosa is the blood. Is that? The, it's communion. That is our, <laughs> that is our communion. <laughs> and I'm also really proud of you for finally fulfilling the requirements of your college of going to church on <laughs> church Sunday. On and Sunday. <laughs> I'm finally you, doing you it. You need to call weeks. them. They really need to reimburse you for that. Yeah. Yeah. You've, yeah. You've I've, more man, than I've been made up cutting them it. a check every month. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for telling us your stories. Um, God, and I'm glad we're, it even ended on a happy note of knowing that there was a lot of reconstruction here, and not just for you, but for other people that you've been able to find. And um, I want to give a shout out to Breakfast Church. 
Uh, if you guys want to, uh, we we uh, if you guys want to pull all of your money together to fly me and Brady out there, it's really cold yeah. here this time of year. Yeah, it's really and cold. we, and my God, we need a vacation so bad. And we just, uh, you know, we've been looking, we've been in the market for a church. Uh, and uh, no, no, I know how she works. Um, the Lord told me that <laughs> you all were going to pay for us to go there in first class i think it was first class because yeah, he does favor us quite a bit yeah okay. uh jesse before we go can you do you, can you prophesy over me and brady real quick yeah please <laughs> can you use oh, your training man um i uh just okay, hey yeah. you know just close your eyes oh no she she does a voice I have to hold your hands okay, okay. i'm right. putting them up Here. to the skype screen <laughs> okay. so i just see like um I'm just seeing some red shoes. I just see some mm, red shoes mm-hmm. that mm. uh, you're, I'm, I feel like the Lord is saying you're looking for your journey home. You know, you just need to get home. Wait, this you is Wizard of Oz. Up. What on, the fuck? Hold on. On hold sale. On. They're okay, on sale. Okay. Are the shoes on Jack's sale? Jack's feeling it. Am I reading mm. your mail? Mm-hmm. Um, oh, this is my mail, honey. Jack is feeling it. And you've been caught up in, in a cyclone, but you know, oh, Jesus. The, mm. the house mm. is going to land on, on the wicked witch in your life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, I'm still, you know, fo- I'm still seeing them red be, shoes, honey. The, the, red, the red shoes you're wearing them. I see you wearing oh, these red shoes. I'm, I know it. Don't you know it? They're your red shoes and mm-hmm. they're going to take you places. Mm-hmm. <laughs> something about, something about dancing and, uh, <laughs> And then Brady. Oh, that was his? Okay. Feeling, mm-hmm. I'm just feeling for you, Brady, like I see an eagle. Mm-hmm. In, an eagle in your life. And this could be like the band. <laughs> the fly. Oh, the, oh, the wrong. I went Bette Midler with that. But Wait a second. Gonna... How did the, the straight guy get the Wizard of Oz? The Wizard of Oz prophecy. And I got the, Some, the you eagles. Know, sometimes, sometimes the Holy Spirit gets our lines crossed. And... You just never, you know, you could take it for what it is. Do you feel like trade? that one was for you? Can we trade? Yeah. Do you feel like that one was for you? Jesse what? and the rest of uh, of Breakfast Church, thank you so much for uh, <laughs> letting us speak with you today. Um, I'm, I'm, I requested off the second week of February, so that's wide open for our, our first class flight. Don't listen to him. <laughs> thank you for listening to Life After. Uh, remember, if you don't go to church, Sunday is just a second, second Saturday. Saturday. What? What?